Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Richard Flanagan is an Australian novelist from Tasmania, whose most recent book, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, won the Man Booker Prize on Tuesday evening, as I'm sure you know. Set around the period of the Second World War, but moving backwards and forwards through time, The Narrow Road details the building of the Burma Death Railway in Thailand by prisoners of war, many of whom were Australian, at the hands of the Japanese. It won, according to the chair of judges, because of the beauty of the writing, the profoundly intelligent humanity, and the excoriating passages of great power. To discuss all of the above, please welcome the 2014 Man Booker winner, Richard Flanagan. Thank you. Hello. Make yourself comfy. Ah, thank you, Paul. Um, first of all, congratulations. Um, how have the last 48 hours been? There must have been quite a whirlwind. Well, it's uh, a bit like surfing an avalanche, really, uh, Paul. And um, so far, I haven't fallen off, and uh, and hopefully I won't. But um, it's uh, really all I've done is media interviews, and everyone asks me how I feel. But um, the moment I'm able to stop doing media interviews, I, I imagine I'll finally find out. But yeah. I, I mean, it's um, it's an astonishing thing. It's an extraordinary honour, and you do know you've gone somewhere else. But um, where that is, I think it takes a lot of a long time to reveal. Because it's quite a long process, isn't it? I mean, the, the long list was announced some months ago, and obviously then it's whittled down. And had you given much thought to winning and then to what that would mean and how that would feel? Uh, I'd given enormous thought to not winning, and uh, I, was, um, I was quite content with that. You know, it, it was an honour to make the long list, um, and I was... Um, you know, I was stunned, and then after a while, I was hung over, and that 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 seemed um, that seemed pleasant enough. And then uh, I was in Seattle on an American book tour, and um, the phone rang at three o'clock in the morning, which was the time they announced the the shortlist here. And I've been upgraded to um, a rather bizarre sort of Northwest hotel room that had a spa in it, so it, it was like sleeping in your laundry. There there was a there was a normal hotel room with a bed, and then there was a large bit of sort of um, uh, plumbing. And, um, and so I was in that darkened hotel room, the phone rang, and I thought I must have missed a plane or something, and it was an alarm, and I leapt up and I fell into the spa, and they, uh, <laughs> they, they told me I was on the short list. So, um, While a jacuzzi I, was swirling around you. Yeah, yeah, I had to pretend to be delighted and not dying. And, uh, but um, when I came to, no, I, I was... Um, I was thrilled, and um, and then this last week and a half, I've I've spent here with the other shortlisted writers, and they were um, a lovely bunch of people, and uh, such gifted writers, and it it was such an honour to be a writer amongst those writers, and um, I I said to Howard Jacobson the night before. Uh, the dinner where the prize was announced that there was a very good argument to be made for each of those books to be awarded the prize. I, I, I mean, I, I must confess I'm pleased that, you know, the arguments were made more strongly for mine, but they could have very easily have been made for any of those other books, and um, uh, many, many people judged any of those books a worthy winner. So, you know, I, I hope this year's Man Booker Prize isn't remembered um, so much for my book winning, but for this extraordinary short list of great talent... Um, uh, that, yeah. that formed it. Well, it was. I saw you talk uh, and read at the festival hall on Monday, and it was really. It was apparent that there was a great deal of kind of camaraderie amongst the, the shortlisted winners, um, which didn't seem false or in any way kind of scripted or anything like. And it, I was just very taken by that because it it felt a very genuine warmth, um, perhaps an, un, an unusual warmth amongst writers for for each other and for the kind of the process that you were all on. Well, the writing world um, hasn't built a large reputation for fraternity or generosity, and uh, so it, it it is that thing that life's ever unexpected. I mean, you would expect to turn up to something like this and perhaps meet some outrageous egos or, or some dreadful posturing, and um, there was none of that. that, that I, and I think it was because they were all considerable talents who knew their own worth um, but who also understood that these 
these prizes are um, a piece of fortune and uh, to, to be a rider is to experience bad luck and hopefully if you're you know a little bit of good luck but you, you must see both of them for what they are and not take them too seriously and I think they were they haven't succeeded none of those riders had succeeded to the extent they had uh, by um, having a false idea of life or what good and ill fortune mean so they were grateful to be there and um, but they didn't take themselves too seriously in consequence who did you think would win then me <laughs> <laughs> well I, I I'm always hard. well I I was um, I'd arrived at a place of um, great equanimity by Tuesday night knowing I wouldn't and um, I'd already done what you're not supposed to and started reaching for the bottle early and uh, I was ready to you know excitedly um, applaud anyone else I um I, I, no I had no idea and everyone I spoke to in uh, English publishing and English in writing who knew anything um, said the same thing that it was impossible to call because it was such a strong shortlist so uh, the only people who seemed to speak with any authorities were the bookies but they pretty much got it wrong anyway yeah. so. um, you said when the book was published that you knew this was a book you had to write if you were ever going to write another book can you explain what you meant by that well, my, uh, my father was a Japanese prisoner of war and he was a survivor of the Death Railway. And I, I'm one of six children and um, I dedicated the book to prisoner Sambiaka Sanji Go, which are the Japanese words for the number 335, which was my father's number in the prisoner of war camp. I knew those words, I've known those words as long as I've known any English words. Uh, there was so much that we all absorbed from my father. And uh, I, I get asked, did he tell stories? Well, yes, he did tell stories, which was unusual, but they were certain sorts of stories. They were um, humorous stories, even with a certain compassion and pity. But more than that, it was, a, I, I, I think... A, a strange and and um, perhaps a strange wound that he communicated to us. He he wasn't um, uh, a tormented man at all. He was a he was a happy man, and um, uh, but I think he carried certain wounds in consequence of that trauma. And I think when people do have those wounds, they don't heal immediately after the trauma. Sometimes they never heal. And sometimes um, they're communicated out to people around them, their, their families, sometimes their communities. And this, this wound, I guess, sort of grew in me. And it, it grew larger and larger. And uh, I, I felt it was sort of choking me. I found it hard to write anything else. And, uh, and I guess because I was a writer, the only way I could sort of divine what this thing was, was by writing a novel about it. And I spent... 12 years doing it I wrote it as five different novels and each of them was um, each of them was a dreadful failure and um, I um, wiped them off my hard drives and I burnt the manuscripts and uh, and I would start again um, and in the end I realized that if I was to approach such darkness um, it would always fail if it didn't allow for the possibility of hope because I, I, I think human beings um, finally are creatures of hope. I think Nietzsche said hope is the cruelest of torments because it prolongs human suffering. But I think it's equally true that hope is the, the essence of who we are. The, without hope, um, we're, we're dead people. I mean, in, in the concentration camps, the the ones the concentration camp mates called the Muslim men were those who had abandoned hope and um, had become so pitiful they expected nothing but death. And they, they were those who were most despised and looked down upon. And if you make art that is completely black, in the end, it's just human nature to revolt against it and dislike it because it's untrue to what we know of ourselves, that in the end, we're sustained by hope. And to me, the, the greatest expression of hope 
or the highest expression of hope is love and I understood it had to be a love story and uh, there was a story that my parents had always been very fond of um, about a, a Latvian man who lived in this uh, little town where I grew up and uh, he'd been caught up in those great movements of people uh, during World War II in Eastern Europe when he got back to his Latvian village it was to find it raised to the ground and his wife he was told dead and um, he refused to believe this and he um, he searched that apocalyptic world of Eastern Europe for the next two years but in the end he had to accept that she was indeed dead and he immigrated to Australia ended up in this little town where my family was and he married an Australian woman had a family and then in 1957 he went to Sydney for a visit and he was walking down a crowded street and he saw his Latvian wife walking toward him um, with a child on either hand and at, and at that point he knew he had but a few moments to decide whether he would acknowledge her or whether he would walk on and, and growing up I was always haunted by this story which I thought was the most beautiful story about love about its costs, about the way it exists um, beyond morality, the way it makes terrible demands of us um, and about something mysterious at its terrible centre. And uh, I was in Sydney in 2002 after I'd finished another novel and I was walking across the Sydney Harbour Bridge which is a beautiful wide walkway. It was late afternoon, it's a, it's a, a beautiful um, a beautiful place to be and uh, I suddenly thought of what it would be like to be a prisoner of war many 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 years after the war to be walking across that bridge in that beautiful late afternoon sun and uh, to see a woman walking towards you who you'd thought dead um, since you were in the prisoner of war camp um, and to see her cat walking towards you alive and I actually rushed back to a pub just near the bridge and I, um, I borrowed a biro off the barman and I wrote what became um, really the defining chapter of this book on the back of beer coasters. And um, that's really how the book begins with a love story and so love stories defined and I've wasted too much time explaining all that, I'm sorry. Not at all, not at all. I'm just glad that there's actually a use for beer coasters these days. The, um, the imperishable, incorruptible yeah, yeah. <laughs> format of beer coasters, Quite. yeah. Um, you said it took 12 years to kind of get this book into its form that we know now. Um, obviously, your father knew that you were, you were writing it. What kind of um, influence, I suppose, did he have on the writing? I mean, you were able to talk to him about his experiences. Did he want to see the manuscripts? Did, he, did you show him any of the, the works as they were going along? My father gave me the greatest of gifts, really. He, he trusted me that I wouldn't get it wrong. He was interested in the fact I was writing this novel, but he never asked me what it was about, beyond the broadest outline, that it had something to do with Japanese prisoners of war. He, um, he never asked to see any drafts. He, he allowed me to be free to be what I had to be, which was a novelist. Um, as I said, I wrote five different versions, all of which failed. And then I realised my father was growing very old and frail. And for no logical reason, I felt that if I didn't finish this book before he died, I would be unable to finish it, which, which makes no sense. Uh, but it, it impelled me to, to, to now return and try and find a way of writing this story uh, and I did spend time with him but I never really researched or interviewed him but I would ask him about very material details what what the what the smell of a rotting shin bone that had been opened up by a, a, a blossoming tropical ulcer might smell like what did a little sour rice ball feel like as it made its way into your intestine um, uh, what, um, what does it feel like to have um, a bony foot cut by the cleft of a limestone rock? 
And that he had recall of that level of, of detail. He liked those questions because they weren't emotional questions, but they allowed him to think about his world and it allowed me to think about it because in the end we don't live in a dramatic world. I think we live in a material world where um, love is the scent of um, someone else's sleeping back and, and death's just a shudder of bad breath. That's how we understand and know life. The idea of, uh, of drama, of um, pity, of love, these things we, we come to later on in, in our um, memories and understanding. But at the moment, in the moment, we know the whole world just through our senses. And it was, I always, I came to see that um, it was in those details that I could arrive at some truth that might make the novel true and real and allow it to avoid any sort of judgment, but be true to what human beings are. Mm. Now, you said you didn't kind of interview your, your father, but the level of detail in the, in the book is extraordinary. And, and so clearly there's a huge amount of, of research that has gone on there. And uh, you, I know you traveled around the world trying to piece this together. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the journey of research that you took? I, I know the book does seem like it was heavily researched, but, but in fact, mostly I made it up. And really? uh, yeah, because I, I was a historian many in another life and I researched a lot, but an, uh, to be a historian or a journalist is to journey outwards to discover what is what is there and to report back on it as accurately as you can. You can gloss and try and find meaning in that, but you make clear wh what is your gloss trying to find meaning and what is it you've seen and touched. But a novelist's journey is, in, I think, in the opposite direction and it's, it's inwards into your own soul. And if occasionally you can breach those treacherous reefs of um, uh, character and history, occasionally you make it in there. And what you discover is not yourself, but a universe of possibility. Um, all the living and all the dead, all, all hate, all love, um, all possibilities of what it is to be human. And it is that that you then seek to communicate back to the reader. And to do that, you throw over this motley of story and character. Um, but you don't need much research to do that. I, I, it's not so hard to imagine what it might be like to, uh, to be starving in a, in a muddy hill, you know, but, but you just must describe accurately what you, what you see and what, what you think it would feel like. Um, but the latter part of your question was about some of the places I went. I did go to... It is true that, that I did go to Thailand and walk the Death Railway. Um, but more importantly, near the end of writing the book, I went to Japan. Um, I didn't want to go and I put it off for a long time, but I knew there were some um, POW guards still alive. And so I, I went there to try and find them and to talk to them. And I didn't go in a spirit of accusation or judgment because I wanted the book not to be about that and, and it, it would not have helped to accuse them or judge them. I, I wasn't interested in that. I just wanted them to talk to them about similar things that I talked to with my father about the material things and also about their worlds, about their upbringing, their childhood and also what, what had happened to them post-war and try and arrive at some understanding. So I, I, I met several guards, um, including some, as it turned out, who'd guarded my father, including one who'd been the, the Ivan the Terrible, my father's camp, um, a man the Australians knew as the Lizard. And, and, and that was a very strange meeting. Um, but he was a, uh, he was a man who was, um, had been sentenced to death for war crimes uh, in 1946, had the sentence commuted to life imprisonment and then was um, released in a general amnesty in 1956. I spoke with he, he, he was, when I met him, a, a gentle and gracious old man. And we spoke for about an hour and a half. And, um, and then for reasons that, I, 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 for the, the, I guess there weren't really any real reasons, I, 
I, I just asked him to slap me because slapping was the principal form of punishment in the camps. It's called binta, is that right? Binta, yeah. And um, I'd talked about binta with him, but he'd been very strong on the fact he wasn't violent. I, I knew he had been very violent. Um, but I was interested in what it would feel like to be slapped. Um, I was interested to see how he would hold himself when he slapped. Anyway, he thought this was a curious request, quite rightly, but finally agreed to it. And we stood up and immediately he assumed this quite um, uh, calculated posture, you know, as a sportsman would. And he knew how to slap to greatest effect. He, he angled his body, he... he um, held his arm in a particular way, he cupped his hand, and then he, he began to slap me. And he, he was an old man, I mean, it, it's not that it hurt particularly. On the third slap, a, a very strange thing happened, that the whole room began to roll and shudder. And, um, and I actually thought I was going mad. I mean, it would have been, a, a, I, I'd... I sort of no longer knew myself. I'd, I'd just said I wanted him to slap me. He was slapping me. The room was now rolling around. But in fact, what had happened was that in, in one of those coincidences which novelists are not allowed but reality delights, a 7.3 Richter scale earthquake had hit, um, had hit Tokyo. And, uh, and so I'm standing... I mean, the room actually rolls like a dinghy in a sea. I'd never been in an earthquake. And it was a big concrete building. And it was in a taxi office. His son owned this taxi company. And um, there were all these keys on the wall. And, the, and they were all making the shimmering tingle as they swayed up and down. And I looked at the lizard, this man who had been so feared and so hated. And he was a frightened old man. And I realised wherever evil was, it wasn't in that room with the lizard and I. The next day I went south to um, a place past Hiroshima, about 65 kilometres south, where my father had ended up a slave labourer at the war's end, working in, inland, uh, working in a coal mine under the inland sea. And um, there I met another guard called Mr Sato, a, a tiny little cockatiel of a man. And um, he was about 92. Again, he was gentle and gracious. And we stood where this slave labour camp had been, above the mine head where the Australian prisoners of war had had to run a gauntlet of sadistic guards and where there now stood a love hotel, of all things. And um, by this stage there was some media uh, because the mayor of the local city had wanted to apologise to me. And then the media had come to this camp and um, they wanted a photo of me with my arm around Mr Sato. And so we did this. We put our arms around each other. And Mr Sato, it was a very cold day. There was this bitter icy wind coming up off the inland sea. And Mr Sato, uh, he, he curled into me in here. His head came to about here. And he curled into me like a child does when it wants forgiveness. And so we're holding each other and he just curls in. And then the photographs are taken and I take my arm away, and he just continues to stay there, just curled in. Uh, and I realise there's... You go somewhere hoping for understanding and explanation, and all you understand is that there's a strangeness in the world beyond any sort of words. So I, I came back to Australia, and um, within a few hours, my father rang, which was uncharacteristic of him. Uh, he was very old by now, he was 98, but his memory was still very good and his recall excellent. And he asked me what had happened in Japan. And I'd said I'd met these different guards, um, that they had, um, I didn't think they felt guilt, but I felt they all felt a deep human shame and I told him what they'd told me, which was to pass their apologies on um, from them to my father for what had happened to him and his friends. And my father couldn't talk, and um, he said he had to go. 
and later that day he lost all memory of his time in the prisoner of war camps and he knew he'd been there as you know you've been a baby in the womb but he no longer he knew it intellectually he didn't he no longer this man who had the most extraordinary recall of it no longer recalled anything and yet he remembered everything before his prisoner of war camp experience and everything after and uh, my sister said to me it, it, it is as if he's finally free so that if you can call that research, that was research. I, I'd gone to these places hoping to be able to divine something about um, about evil, yeah. about why people do these things. And in the end I'd come back and I realised I understood nothing. And I went back to my table and kept on making it up. <laughs> Extraordinary. Um, well, Richard has agreed to read uh, a short passage of the, of the novel to us. I think you're book is being presented on a platter. This is just a short reading, but the, the context for it is that um, central to the novel is one character who at the beginning of a one day in the prisoner of war camp is um, folds his blanket um, the wrong way in contravention of the prison camp regulations and he's rifle butted by a guard in consequence. And this sets in train a series of small physical setbacks through the day that culminate in this man finally being beaten to death um, for a crime he didn't commit. Um, and so this takes place, uh, this chapter takes place after the war. Decades later, Jimmy Bigelow would insist that his kids always fold their clothes so, fold ever outwards. He would open the drawers of the chest of drawers in their suburban weatherboard home in Hobart to make sure that they were safe and the fold was out. He would never hit or smack them for not folding their clothes with the fold out. He would beg and plead. He would order and demand, and in the end, exasperated, he would refold and restack their clothes himself as they stood by nervously waiting. He would feel some nameless terror that was beyond him to explain, a confusion they too would carry with them for the rest of their lives that was both love and fear, that was beyond the drawers opening and closing beyond their father's frustration and mumbling. He knew they didn't understand. But could they not see? How could they not know? It should have been so obvious what had to be understood. You could never know when everything might change. A mood, a decision, a blanket, a life. They knew none of it. They only knew that whatever they did, he would never hurt them. At the very worst, he would throw them over his knees, bring his hand up, and then hold it there, hovering over their bottom. Sometimes they would feel him shaking through his knees and thighs. They would still look upwards and see his hand trembling his eyes watery. How could they know that their father was desperately trying to protect them from the unexpected smash of a rifle butt into their soft child's cheeks to warn them of what horrors this hard world had ready for the unwary, the unwise and the unprepared to prepare them all for those things for which no one could ever be ready they knew only this one thing, that he would never hurt them. As his body trembled back and forth through time, they knew what he meant when he said, Rightio, and suddenly threw them off his lap and back onto their feet. Averting his eyes, he would wave them away with an extended hand. That's it. Rightio, just 
Just put the fold out next time. Out. Always out. Rightio. And they would run outside into the sun. Perhaps he wondered he didn't make the time or space he should for love. He fitted it in and it flitted away. Perhaps he somehow chose why he couldn't say the predictable lines of work over love's wild circling, the folding of a blanket over the unfolding of locked arms. But sometimes it was just there, staring out an open window to see little Jody look up and wave to him with the biggest smile. He was shocked to see love playing in a backyard of brown grass under a sprinkler's diamond spill. Shocked to know he had been lucky enough to live and know it. To love and be loved. And he would watch his children playing outside in the sun. Ashamed. Amazed. It was always sunny. Thank you. Well, now it's your turn. So we're opening up the floor to you. There are some mics going to be handed around. So if you have any questions for Richard, put your hand in the air and a microphone will kind of appear behind you. There it is, look. Off you go. Uh, when I was growing up, we, I was kind of found out about Japanese and uh, prisoner war camp kind of things from films like Tenko, Bridge Over the River Kwai, um, and uh, Town Called Alice and stuff like that. And also stories from my school teachers who'd served in the army or in, in, um, in uh, prison of war camp, Mr. Birch, I remember, and he always used to tell us off for leaving food on our, din on our dinner plate. So when you were doing your research, did you talk to any, apart from your father and any other kind of Second World War veterans? Um, <coughs> no, I didn't. No, I, I, I didn't research. I, I remember I was, I've just come off a book tour in America and um, uh, I had to do some, ri some ridiculous questionnaire and they, they said, um, how did you research? And I, I, I just wrote, I lived, the rest is detail. I, I really didn't talk to anyone else. I didn't read that much. You know, I, I felt that I carried it within me and that what mattered was trying to understand this thing within me and, um, and the best way or the only way I knew, I knew of doing that was by writing a novel. So um, it's not that all these other witnesses, these other experiences aren't without validity, they, they have enormous validity and worth, but that wasn't my um, path to writing this novel. It's not how I think novels are best made. Gentleman in the front row. Hi, uh, first of all, congratulations for winning the, the, winning the prize. It's an amazing Thank book. Um, I just wondered, you know, you, you, you said the story about um, the, your experience of Sydney on, on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Did you ever consider a, a different um, ending to that episode where Dorigo meets or sees Amy in the street and does acknowledge her? Um, no, no, well, no, not really because, uh, because of what I was talking about before that, that, that love demands death. Or, or not love doesn't demand death, but a love story demands death. And so uh, I felt, no, it wasn't possible. I, I did briefly toy with it, and I think I even wrote a version that had it, and um, all the power immediately leached out of it. So I, uh, I, I think because I had the strong sense that a love story, a love story has certain rules and conventions, but they're not the rules and conventions of love. The rules and conventions that speak to the deep psychological and spiritual truths of love. 
and it was those that I was trying to um, uh, conform to in writing the story. So, um, uh, no. We shall end it there. Thank you very much indeed. Please give a big round of applause for Richard Fanning. Thank you.